Good morning. Uh, I'm Scott Friedman, Dean for Therapeutic Discovery. I want to welcome you as well to Sane Innovations. We have a spectacular program. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Daniel Kraft, who's founder and executive director of Exponential Medicine and Medicine Track faculty chair at Singularity University. Dr. Kraft is a Stanford and Harvard trained physician scientist, inventor, entrepreneur, and innovator. He has over 20 years of experience in clinical practice, biomedical research, and healthcare innovation. Daniel chairs the medicine track for Singularity University and is founding executive director for Exponential Medicine, a program which explores convergent, exponentially developing technologies and their potential in biomedicine and healthcare. His various TED Talks have over one million views. Dr. Kraft has been named one of the 40 smartest people in healthcare by uh, Becker's Hospital Review. Internalmedicine.com named him one of the top 10 in, uh, internal smart doctors in the world, 2013, and he was recognized as one of the most inspiring le leaders in life sciences as determined by the readers of Pharma Voice 100. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Kraft. Thanks very much. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. I've, I've, I've visited Mount Sinai a few times and really impressed by um, the amazing innovative work you're doing. And, um, and we've got about 30 minutes now to go pretty quickly and explore a bit about the future of health and medicine from the digital perspective and beyond. And it's, you know, it's a really exciting time for innovation and technology to converge and enable us to think and reimagine the future of health and medicine across a whole bunch of spectrums, our own personal health and prevention uh, and those of our patients, the future of diagnostics, therapeutics, how we can democratize healthcare around the planet, and even discovery, how can we improve clinical trials and, and beyond. But before we sort of look into the future, it's fun to always go a bit back to the future. And as you know, this last week was back to the future week. I'm still waiting for my hoverboard, though I think you can get a few on, on Kickstarter. Um, I dressed up for it. Um, actually, the future of clinical trials, I think, is still back in 30 years ago, if you've ever done clinical trials. Um, but you know, as you look into the future, it's interesting to look, like, to look at what did the future used to look like in the past. I come from California, um, where Kaiser Hospital uh, System started. And when they started in the 1950s, they made this little movie about what they thought the future would look like. Take a look. A medical dream comes true under the drive of industrialist Henry Kaiser, who holds the plans of the ultra-modern hospital designed by Dr. Sidney Garfield, director of the Kaiser Foundation. From the admissions office on, everything is streamlined and expedited. The patient's record reaches the doctor before he does. This is the last word in a combination X-ray machine and fluoroscope imported from Holland at a cost of $25,000. Every portion of the body through 180 degrees can be photographed. In the operating room, the first light of its kind is installed. No portion of an operation is ever in shadow. Nor is the expectant father forgotten. Here he can get the news officially and suffer under the most comfortable circumstances possible. And for mother, well, she has only to call for her baby, and baby comes sliding through a wall in a draw-like bassinet for a little visit with the new mother. In this $2 million institution, doors are opened by remote control, and on the single floor, patients are easily moved from place to place. Dream grounds for a dream hospital. The answer to a doctor's prayer. The doctor's prayers, not the patient's prayers. I'm sure you guys have a swimming pool here for everybody, right? Um, so I had a chance myself to go back to the future recently. I went to medical school at Stanford, did my residency at MGH. We had our 200th anniversary of this venerable institution. Had a chance to have a reunion with the house staff. And how many medical students are here? This is back in the day when we were real residents. 80 hours was not the limitation. Um, so, um, but it was a great reunion. Um, had a chance after one of the receptions to sneak upstairs to one of the most famous spots of healthcare innovation and, and history. It's called the Ether Dome. And it's called the Ether Dome because back in 1846, this patient in this very picture was the first to get general anesthesia with their surgery. I think before that, they used to literally bite the bullet. This picture is clearly before HIPAA laws. Um, and if you go to the Ether Dome today, it's pretty much like it looked in 1846, frozen in time. You can see the actual sponge and instruments back in the case. We'll have some special grand rounds there and M&Ms, but pretty much frozen in time. I wandered about four minutes down the hall that night to the ward where I spent my first month as a terrified young intern back in 1996. And to my shock and dismay, that was also frozen in time. Some of the same alarms were beeping, a little PTSD, some of the same, same nurses, maybe some of the same patients. 
Um, only difference was the young intern on call was pushing around an old laptop, had to type out the EMR, print it out, put it in the paper chart, and the front desk there is still using the medical cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, the fax machine. So my thought was, at even a great institution like MGH, in many ways, healthcare is still being practiced like 1846 in, in old silos and old ways of thinking and specialties and fiefdoms that have been developed over millennia. And you know, we're now in this new connected age, this genomic age, this digital age. We can start to think differently about health and medicine outside of the traditional bucket of body parts and subspecialties and use that new thinking and some of these new technologies to address some of these uh, challenges we have in health uh, across uh, different, different realms. So if you think, you know, here in New York, California, anywhere in the world, our healthcare systems are much more actually sick care systems. They're based on intermittent and reactive models. Intermittent meaning, we'll get the occasional blood pressure check, the EKG when you come into the clinic, your patient, if you're lucky, scribbles down their blood sugar numbers and maybe faxes them in or brings them in a minimal uh, envelope. And so we're intermittent with our data and then we're very reactive. We're waiting for the heart attack, the stroke, the lump to be discovered at stage three. I would argue with some of our new thinking in digital health and beyond, we can be more continuous with our data and more proactive and move out of this model of you know, waiting three weeks for the average doctor visit and 36 minutes in the waiting room for the average 12 minute visit, whether you're here in New York City or in Calcutta. And of course, technology is just a piece of the future of innovation. Part of it is really about the incentives. We live much more not in an evidence-based medicine world, but one that's reimbursement-based. Uh, as you know, in the fee-for-service world, we're spending most of our dollars on the 80% uh, of our costs on 20% or so who have, who have uh, advanced chronic disease, or sometimes 50% of our care on 5% of the population. And with this new accountable care era, value-based care, the incentives are shifting things to the left, and technology, digital connection, et cetera, is gonna move this puck, hopefully, in that direction. So the vocabulary is changing, how we're gonna be rewarded as physicians and healthcare systems is shifting, and that overlaps with the opportunities of technology. Where healthcare happens is also an interesting shift that's happening today. It's no longer the traditional ICU, ER, uh, intensive care unit. The pressures are never to admit the patient in the first place or to discharge them sooner, and technology is enabling healthcare to come to our homes and onto our bodies. The Internet of Things coming to the Internet of Medicine and, and beyond. And where healthcare happens is being challenged by our, you know, the Walmarts of the world have the most primary care opportunities in the U.S., for example. So we have competition from our corner, corner pharmacies. One other element from framing is the new empowered consumer really has a lot more insight into what's happening. You can compare one hospital to another, uh, how their outcomes are. You can go online and compare the, the prices for drugs in pharmacies across the street. This new era of transparency or sort of a Yelp for medicine. And this whole digital shift in transparency and connection is being empowered by things like Moore's Law. You all know the power of computing in our pockets now. Moore's Law has enabled these to be about a billion times more powerful and less expensive than the best supercomputers at MIT in the 70s, or your tablet computers you have on your lap today are more powerful than a crazy supercomputer in the 90s. And Moore's Law is an example of an exponential type of technology, doubling every 18 to 24 months in terms of speed and, speed and price performance. And it's challenging, though, for us to sort of think exponentially. If we think linearly, which is where our brains are wired, if I took 30 linear steps, I'd be about to the exit sign. But if I took 30 exponential steps, doubling, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, by the 15th step, I'm at 32,000. But by that 30th step, boom, I'm at a billion. That's 26 times around the planet. It's sometimes hard for our minds to grok that. But that's an example of exponentials, which we see all around us. It's why the, the desktop of 2000 fits on our smartphone, now fits on our smartwatch. You know, and if we had to go back even seven years to the first iPhone, for example, and use it, it would feel old and clunky. And now, it, at the time, it, found, it felt magical. So, you know, what's the iPhone 10 going to be like or the smartphone version 5? Lots of opportunities to layer those into healthcare. And with exponentials sort of speeding up, we're now seeing computers the size of a grain of rice, which can connect almost all of our medical devices uh, uh, and the whole internet world uh, to internet of the body. So it's an interesting time. These things aren't just getting faster, they're also getting cheaper. You know, you can buy a $50 tablet today. There are $35 tablets being sold in India. Soon we can democratize healthcare with these uh, more pervasive technologies, uh, and everyone on the planet has the opportunity to be connected. So we're here today, a little bit of the theme of digitization. The ability now to take those paper records, digitize them, still painful, uh, to take our genomics, all this information, blend it together, is often called digital health, connected health, mobile health. I think most of those are buzzwords. So we'll just call it health. We don't call it digital music or digital movies. Um, but it creates a new opportunity to address new challenges, not just through Moore's Law, but other exponentials, from big data to robotics to 3D printing to nanotechnology to synthetic biology, all converging. And it's at their overlap in the conversion space where I think the real opportunity for shifting things happens. 
and the opportunity to address the grand challenges we have, the rising costs, the aging demographic, access to care. There's a shortage of primary care physicians and specialists in most parts of the country. We uh, have a, a big data overload. I mean, how do we make sense of the big data? We don't care about the data. We want that to be actionable information we can use as clinicians, as patients, as caregivers. And how do we get rid of all the waste, 30% of our healthcare dollar in, in sort of triplicate forums and repeating tests? And while many innovations are here and exciting, we have our challenges with our friends, the FDA, the F word, they're not always thinking exponentially, and our friends, the payers, who are challenged on how do you value or pay for an app or a new sort of uh, a device. So I think if you look around, disruptions all around us. You know, I came back to Stanford well, 15 years ago to do fellowships in hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplant. None of these basically existed back then. They've changed the world dramatically. Um, and I think that disruption is coming to healthcare. You all know about Uber, right? Um, you know, Uber's only five years old, over $50 billion valuation. They didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online maps, online payments, or limos or ta taxis. They connected the dots. And now it's easier and more transparent and low, low stress to get transportation. So I like to ask what question, who's going to build the Uber of healthcare? And actually, I tweeted that out a few months ago, and a couple of companies saying back, we've, we've already built it. Medicast, this one in New York, pager, press a button on your smartphone, and a doctor comes to your apartment within three hours. Not sure what kind of doctor, but you get a doctor. And uh, remember, they can rate you, and you can rate them. So the house call, as was in the New York Times last week, may be coming back through some of these uh, platforms. Uber themselves did a pilot here in New York last fall, press a button on the app, and a nurse would come and give you a flu shot. And this Uberification, you know, the, the, the digital natives kind of want that kind of ease and transparency, and those of us who are older as well, I think has an opportunity to inform healthcare. So obviously disruption's coming, it's coming to our friends in pharma, it's coming to primary care, it's coming to many specialties, and our opportunity here in the next few days is to think about disrupting ourselves as opposed to being the next Kodak or Blackberry or Blockbuster. So I get a chance to sort of look at this area um, from the convergence point. Uh, I chair the medicine track at something called Singularity University. It's based in the heart of Silicon Valley, NASA Ames, one exit from Google, about 15 minutes from Stanford. Uh, Co-founded by Ray Kurzweil, uh, who's now director of engineering at Google. Peter Diamandis, who started the XPRIZE. And we have tracks in biotech, robotics, AI, 3D printing, nanotechnology, and more. We ask, how do these exponential technologies converge to impact grand challenges across the planet, from poverty and education to healthcare? In our 10-week programs and our shorter programs, about half of the projects and new ideas and companies that have emerged have been focused on healthcare, often coming from people outside of traditional medicine. So it's a really interesting time for innovation and new thinking. And because so much of medicine is being informed by, by different players, I founded a program now five years ago, it's called Future Med, now called Exponential Medicine, where we bring together folks from across subspecialties, across technologies, to think where is healthcare going. We've had Eric Shadow on our faculty, we'll have Joel Dudley there this year. We've grown exponentially to now about 600 folks. We'll be at the Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego, warm San Diego, in two weeks. We have about 10 spots left. So. So we'd love to have some of you uh, join me and Joel there uh, in two weeks as we look at this in a deep dive for four days. Okay, so let's look at a few areas and how they're shifting and how there's opportunity for change. First of all, health and prevention. As the incentives shift to this realm, we realize that it's not our genetics that are so empower powerful in terms of our health outcomes, it's often our behaviors. And if you think about the new drug, it's really the empowered, engaged patient who can be the CEO or at least the COO of their health. And it's no longer the doctor being God, it's now the, the engaged patient who might own their data, uh, help plan their care, share their information with clinical trials and beyond, and be empowered and sometimes on risk with, with their behaviors. We know that you know, sitting's the new smoking. Uh, small amounts of activity can be one of the best drugs and preventatives that's out there. And we're in this new age of, of, of connected devices. How many people here have a Fitbit or something like that? I'm wearing like three of them right now, right? How many have lost yours and flushed it down the toilet or lost the battery charger, right? You know, these are great. They're, they're starting in the consumer side, obviously, but I would argue we're moving from this world of, of quantified um, self, which is sort of the consumer side, to quantified health. They're going to pervade almost everything we do in, in healthcare and create these smart feedback loops and connections to our EMRs and big data and beyond as we move forward. We're moving from the wearables on our wrist to insideables, you know, contact lenses being developed by Google, of all people, partnering with Big Pharma to do real-time blood glucose on your contact lens from incitables to even this idea of trainables. These, this feedback loop comes to you directly. So for example, my, my posture has never been great. Now there's a little technology out of Israel, it'll buzz your back when you're hunched over your laptop typing your EMR record. It can be your like, digital mom. But after wearing this for a week, it'll improve your posture and you can take off the app on the device. We're seeing the sensors get smaller, faster, more integrated. They're gonna disappear. Um, there's now pills with RFID tablets that can track adherence. We're seeing you know, watches, some developed by Google, that are actually medicalized, or rings that can be a sleep lab that you can wear when you sleep that can give you lots of data. 
We're seeing um, the uh, quantified self-technologies disappear into our clothes, into our cars, into our environment. Um, and you know, my, while these might be used by athletes today, your heart failure patients or COPD patients may, may have these embedded in their shirts. This used to be the future, you know, from Wired Magazine, artifacts in the future, the connected diaper. Well, future's coming faster than you think. Last year, Huggies came out with TweetPee. You can figure out what that does. Um, <laughs> there's also data for number two, sometimes too much information, right? But I, I'm trained in pediatrics as well. It might be useful if we want to send a child home from the NICU a couple of days early with a connected onesie or a, a, a medical censored uh, teddy bear, right? You know, here's my son about a year ago doing his part for medicine wearing a connected onesie. I didn't need that to tell me he's waking up every two hours. But for some of our patients, this sort of ability to connect and in integrate data might be very useful. Other, you know, connected binkies, all sorts of things are coming. And other things we can quantify that might be off your radar. So a company called Breathometer does a, a blood, al blood alcohol level. You blow in air, and if your blood alcohol level is too high, it can lock you out of your car, call you an Uber. But this new version actually tests the quality of your breath, um, which might be important for some diseases. It also tracks hydration, might be important for some patients. Um, and so uh, this kind of thing can be quantified in interesting ways, including the digitization of, of nano noses, which can pick up some diseases early, like, like lung cancer uh, and colon cancer. We're seeing other things you can quantify, your emotional state, our mental states of ourselves and our patients have so much impact on healthcare costs and downstream uh, elements. What if your laptop computer camera can pick up your emotional state over time or your voice uh, can be a sensor to your emotional state? We're seeing you know, phones now become a digital sort of sensor for mental status. If you uh, have a bipolar patient, if they're manic or they're depressed, they'll be tweeting differently, moving differently, using social networks differently. That can be picked up. Biomarkers for suicidality from your mobile phone, I think will be important, uh, not just for suicide, but for everything uh, in our mobile phone as a sensor for mental health can be leveraged. We're gonna see the disappearance of wearables. MIT published that we can use Wi-Fi to pick up the, the vital signs of up to 10 people in a room uh, at the same time. So we'll see new seamless ways of integrating this data. It'll bring us to a point where we're digitally almost always online with our vital signs and beyond, sometimes in surprising places. We'll have the ability to integrate this data, like Google Now for Health, not just telling us to leave early based on the traffic, but to you know, remind us to stand up, what my watch does, you know sitting being the new smoking. These aren't yet always very contextual, tell me to stand up while I'm flying on an airplane or driving, but these are gonna to start to learn you over time. We'll get this data in interesting places. Um, sometimes it's good to unplug. I would encourage us all to unplug, not just in the bath. Um, but it's, you know, this new digital exhaust, how do we make sense of it? It's, it's a lot of data. And only this last year, our consumer companies like Apple enabling us to flow through our smartphone, it's a, it could be your scale, blood pressure, blood pressure cuff glucometer, and into EMRs like, like Epic in the early stages. So, you might be prescribing a patient a wearable or an app and have that device flow back to you as a clinician. Very early stages. The challenge is we don't want to have all the raw data. How do we understand what's even normal in this sort of digital exhaust stage? Google baseline studies coming. How can we integrate this into simple metrics like a, a FICO score for your health? Not just your vital sign data, but social network information, your financial health. All those things come together to impact health and wellness, diagnostics, and therapy. And as clinicians and beyond, we don't want to be looking at raw data. If you're a good ICU doctor, you can look up blood pressure, temperature, see when a patient's going septic, but new algorithms can sometimes pick that up hours earlier. I like to call that predictalytics. How do we integrate all this information and make us smarter and more proactive, not just with sepsis, but in prevention, diagnostics, and therapy? And where I think this is heading is analogized maybe by our, our modern cars. Our modern cars that have three or 400 sensors in them, you don't care about any one sensor, temperature and piston three, you care about when your check engine light goes on, and hopefully that means you go off to see your, your uh, mechanic. I think we'll have the equivalent of an OnStar for the body uh, coming, and we're not gonna, you know, these technologies are being democratized or, or sort of commoditized, 20 bucks for one of these. It's gonna be how we integrate and use the data where there's big business and, and, and as well as innovation opportunities. Companies like Centrainer, creating data from the home and giving that check engine light to the clinician for CHF patients and beyond. And because in the prevention side, you know, behavior change is so hard, if you have an actual coach, that can change things for both prevention or managing disease. There's now sort of digital coaching platforms you can download and interact with a real coach. We're seeing AI versions of these come, a great one called Lark. Um, you can download today, it's sort of like a, a her from the movie that learns you how much you're walking, how much you're eating, how your sleep is doing, gives you kind of fun feedback loop. It knows sort of your history for the last few months. It'll even remind you on your smartphone, like I am way behind on my sleep, time to get some sleep tonight. Kind of interactive and fun. This will be managing, I would argue, chronic disease in the future in a very high touch way. 
we'll have our coaches in our, in our mirror in the morning. You might wake up in the morning and see a sort of overview of your vital signs from the last day or two, or reminders to take your meds, um, maybe some coaching for your health or, or medical regimen. But what if not just the mirror of today? What if you could see future you? What if you're trying to convince a patient to lose weight and you can show them future you when you look in the mirror, right? Future you today, you lose, you know, you're doing some working out, you're doing your P90X, future you, right? What if you're eating donuts for breakfast every morning? Future you. you know, that can change the wiring of your brain a little bit. And you don't need to wait for the magic mirror. You can download an app, here's me now, and here's me 100 or 1,000 donuts later. Future me, yikes, so, so I, I hold off the Dunkin' Donuts. Or if you're coaching a young patient who's smoking two packs a day and showing what her skin's gonna look like. This idea of sort of augmented reality, before and after smoking, can be a very powerful lever to change, whether it's smoking or if you're spending too much time on Facebook, right? So, Augmented reality is another world that's coming to hopefully augment us as clinicians and patients. You know, Google Glass isn't so new anymore. It was sort of laughed at in the consumer realm, but one of its best applications is in the clinic. You know, whether you're using this to scribe so someone can watch your exam and type for you or bring in data as, a, as an interventionalist or, or beyond, these are going to have tremendous implications, including in education. You know, the HoloLens from Microsoft, they're partnering with Mayo Clinic and others to learn anatomy in this way. Or we're going to see, uh, just a fun one I saw last week at Singularity U, you know, overlapping the real world with augmented data. This is just a small example. You know, this is sort of for fun. They're imagining you're taking CT scan data, MRI data, other information, and you can essentially overlay that a patient with a fracture or over a surgical wound. Um, and these things can, again, almost be downloaded for free and interacted, not just for, you know, buzzing around a helicopter, but to integrate health information to empower uh, the patient, the consumer, the caregiver, um, beyond. So lots of interesting ways that AR and VR are coming. Virtual reality, full-on immersion, you know, the $3 billion version got acquired by Facebook, so Google said, ha, we'll build one out of cardboard for like six bucks, right? Think about how these can be used for putting people in new environments with PTSD, or in the operating room, for example. You can have now Oculus Rift and be right where the anesthesiologist is. This will be great for the medical student who can't see. If you put on Oculus, this is just something I played with here, you're like you're in the operating room, and you can learn and educate in really empowering ways. So lots of ways to, I encourage you to get some in your lab here and, and innovate with these technologies in ed education uh, and beyond. Health and wellness, of course, is tied as, uh, to, to our genomics. A lot of great work here uh, being done by Eric Schatt and others, driven by the lowering exponential cost of genomics. We're now at twice the rate of Moore's Law in terms of decrease of a genome, from millions of dollars a few years ago to $1,000 today. The challenge is, what happens when a patient presents to you with their genome on a disk drive? What do you do with that data? It's a challenge. To, it has to be part of our workflow, or, or it's a bit of a so what. You'll be meeting uh, Linda Avey or, uh, later uh, at this conference, who's a friend, and started 23andMe. You can already, for $100, spit in two, drop your saliva in the mail, and get your pharmacogenomics back. Why aren't we leveraging that in the clinic? From here's my warfarin uh, genomics, here's 15 other drugs based on me. That should be part of our EMR and part of our guidance. My primary care doc should know my genetic risks based on uh, genomics and beyond. And I can be empowered to see that information and change my own health and behavior. Because I own my 23andMe data, I can upload that to a new website called Athletogen. It looks at my athletic abilities through my genes. And sure enough, I was always a good sprinter, have good metabolic efficiency, never good at cross country. My endurance is kind of low. Would like to get up and do my workouts in the morning, but I have trouble getting out of bed. I have an excuse. As you see, my motivation genes are low, you know? So, <laughs> but that's an example of complicated genetic information being contextualized and useful potentially in the clinic in a variety of ways. Helix just launched, which is gonna be an app store for your genome. Lots of potential coming there. And of course, it goes well beyond genomics. We're in the proteome age. We won't be just ordering a Chem 20, it'll be a Chem 10,000. The environment, your exposome, wherever your patients lived, if they're growing up in Manhattan or a, a farm in Idaho, very different exposures. The microbiome, getting very interesting now, you know, 10 times more bacterial cells on and in our body than human cells. And we're learning that plays a role in everything from obesity and inflammatory bowel disease to impact, impacting psychiatry. Uh, we're obviously learning we can treat C. diff patients now with fecal transplants. Not a sexy idea, but it seems to be very effective. And I would argue in the near future, we'll be doing microbiome transplants for a whole slew of diseases. You can even analyze your own microbiome. One of our Singularity University students started Ubiome, sent a few swabs in the mail, and have your own sort of 23andMe version of your microbiome, which changes over time. You can actually donate that data to improve science as well. In my field of bone marrow transplant, we're starting to even bank stool before a transplant, or before you give someone a big dose of antibiotics to have their sort of own microbiome reserved for a reboot. Other things in health and prevention that are kind of old school technologies would be things like meditation and yoga, ancient technologies, but we're learning that those can be powerful and impactful to our brain. You know, neuroscience is expanding dramatically and our ability to see the impacts of these technologies and democratize them is interesting. 
Um, for example, there are now consumer brain-computer interfaces. This example of a, the Muse device, a couple hundred dollars, you can buy it online. There's an app called Calm. You can actually see my data here. I'm, I'm calm for three whole minutes, right? You can gamify meditation. And imagine prescribing this to your patients who might have anxiety or depression to get them on top of a new regimen um, and, and just improve their sort of brain health. This was published just last week in PLOS, um, giving uh, patients with high utilization, meditation type tools, lowered utilization, uh, 43%, clinical encounters down by 41%, lab encounters, huge impacts from ma managing our, our mind state. And beyond these sort of consumer versions of brain computer interface, we're seeing these potentially be used to treat kids with ADHD. They, they play the game, they focus, the game goes, they get off of Ritalin, for example, might be good for some adults as well. We're seeing BCIs move to the very advanced stage uh, at my alma mater. Uh, oh, oh, one other one is applying energy to your brain, so not just reading your brain, hacking energy in can be ap applicable in interesting ways. Brain computer interfaces for the disabled, my alma mater, Brown University, uh, with, I went to Brown with Ken Rosenzweig, who's here, uh, is now amazing for Example, quadriplegic, who by thinking alone can control a robotic limb. And these are getting smaller, more implantable, Bluetooth enabled. We'll see the disabled be in some cases super enabled and be connected to their worlds in, in really uh, um, imaginative ways. If we look at where we can do cognitive enhancement, enhancement for those who have normal cognition or others, there's a whole set of tools coming, including things like video games. My friend at UCSF, Adam Gasly, has pioneered video games to improve cognition, cover of nature last year, now blending that with not just being on your tablet, but with movement that can rewire the brain even faster. So keep playing those Atari games, so at least it maybe was good for me in the past. How about the future of diagnosis? You know, from the oncology realm, we're often picking up people late stage, stage three and stage four. What if we could pick up oncology elements and others at what I like to call stage zero? Back to neuroscience for a sec second. Alzheimer's, such a huge cost center, so difficult to, impossible to treat once it clinically presents itself. There are now new brain scans, PET scans, bl blood biomarkers, and even uh, eye tracking devices that can pick up and predict who's gonna get Alzheimer's 10 or 20 years early. What if, just like we give statins to folks at high risk for cardiovascular disease, we're able to take some of these new drugs in development that can stop or reverse plaques uh, and, and, and give that at stage zero. We'll see the evolution of diagnostic devices. They're moving from you know, the old stethoscope that I went to medical school with to the digital version. The digital version has an app, which in some cases can do heart sound diagnosis better than a cardiologist. We can de-skill diagnosis with some of these digital tools. Everything from a connected blood pressure cuff, you know, one in three Americans has hypertension, but less than half have it well controlled. What if you prescribe a patient a digital blood pressure cuff that they can pick up at a Best Buy on Apple store? Uh, all these things are moving to digital realms. You can have these in your pocket from an otoscope to a uh, digital um, uh, tool for, for otoscope for pediatrics, slips on your smartphone, uh, for dermatology and beyond. We're seeing now ultrasounds that used to be $100,000 shrink exponentially to give you a digital exam in your pocket. You already see those in the ERs and beyond. We're seeing colposcopes being made into smartphones. We're seeing the eye exam shift to something that can fit on a smartphone as well. This company that started at MIT went to India for their first clinical trials, and now we're back here in, in New York with uh, basically the ability to do your eyeglass exam, your retina exam, and now they've actually democratized that with a sort of an Uber for eye care, which you can try here, called Blink. Someone comes to you with your eye exam on a mobile device, and new business models emerging in diagnostics. How about the world of cardiology? As the dean mentioned, such a, a major area now. There's new tools. For example, my, little, my favorite one is developed by a cardiologist, the Alive Core EKG case. $40 case on your smartphone, do a live EKG, send that anywhere on the planet. It does basic analysis. Do, are you an AFib or not? We could probably pass this around the room and find someone who has a diagnosis they don't have. The new versions of this will do six leads. Um, and the one I just piloted with my friend who invented this last week at so TCT. Take a look what's available and now. Touch it. I'm going to and, my EKG. and hold it. And now you also annotate it. So if you were feeling bad, you skip beats, short of breath, chest pain, you would be talking to it at the same time it's recording your electrocardiogram. And so that's all happening today. And so as soon as you finish that, you press save. And now it will process the ECG, display it, then use the digital crown to scroll through it. Then use force touch to play the audio, and that will bring it up. There you go, there I am. Help and, me, doctor. And there it is. So I can get context. I can say I'm having chest pain, have the EG, and this will eventually go right to the cloud. And, right it, also, and it also takes all your heart rate and activity data since the last recording to really say, did I start to slow down? Has my heart rate become irregular? So it's really... So interesting possibilities, just an example. That's the pilot uh, or the prototype of that. 
Beyond that, you can have an intensive care unit on a patch. This is a Band-Aid from a company called Vital Connect. I'm usually wearing one in my shirt. Usually it connects to the cloud. You can get my streaming data anywhere you have the password. My full EKG, my heart rate, my stress level, my posture. If I fall down and don't get up, this can tell you. This could be used in the inpatient setting. I've been to many codes in the wards where no one's monitored. This will be used in the outpatient setting. That's a lot of data, though. Who wants to be looking at this streaming data? Who's liable for this? How do you keep this private and, and useful? Um, once you maybe make a cardiac diagnosis, our friends in, uh, in interventional cardiology are being disrupted by this convergence of digital diagnostics in the cloud. A CT scan, data sent to the cloud, now can figure out your FFR. How narrow is that blood vessel? Does that patient need a bypass? Does that patient need a stent? Um, maybe we're going to even uh, personalize or even 3D print the stent to match that patient's anatomy. Just FDA cleared. This is going to change the world of uh, cardiology. A company I advise out of Stanford also can do a four-minute a three-minute MRI and give you everything in an echocardiogram and more, all the valvular data back to the patient and the clinician within minutes, all calculated in the cloud. So things are going to be disrupted in that realm. Other sorts of digital technologies are being incentivized by new thinking. I've been an advisor for the X Prize. We designed a medical tricorder uh, X Prize. You remember Star Trek medical tricorder? This idea now that we can actually build a consumer device in the patient's home that can do what a medical tricorder does. About 400 teams started this competition. One of them started at my future medicine program called Scanadu. This is one of the devices that just started shipping in clinical trials. Hold it to your forehead as a patient at home. Pick up your heart rate, temperature, O2 stat, calculate your blood pressure. Talk to your smartphone, integrates with IBM Watson. This will be part of what our consumers have at home beyond maybe just a thermometer today. And what's interesting, this company crowdfunded the clinical trial. Pretty interesting days on how to fund innovation. They've also developed for urinalysis a smart way of, you know, why bring in your urine, dip it at home, take a picture with your, your smartphone app, and the app itself does the urinalysis, sends that data to you, the clinician, to the CDC, to the NSA, or else wants the information, right? Um, it might be cold flu or Ebola season. You can also spit in a version of the tube and the line show up. And again, the app makes the diagnosis. New ways of doing point of care labs, whether that's for the flu or printout tests for Ebola done on paper. Uh, the world era of microfluidics is coming. Uh, the, what we can do at a corner pharmacy or at home. I was actually last night with Elizabeth Holmes from in, in hot water with Theranos. But today I can go in Palo Alto to the Walgreens and do a small amount of blood and get a fair amount of lab data back. We'll see what's behind that pretty soon. But interesting era about where we can connect data and acquire it. And from the oncology realm, we'll be moving from tissue biopsies to blood biopsies. You know, thousands of proteome biomarkers, genomics as, as well. Not just, you know, a prenatal testing, but looking for the same DNA from a cancer in our blood, for example. So with this overwhelming amount of digital data, how do we make sense of it? You all know about IBM Watson and artificial intelligence. It sometimes threatens us. We're going to be replaced by AI. I like to reframe it as IA, intelligence augmentation. We're going to be augmented by all these tools in the near future as Watson and others connect with Medtronic, Apple, J&J. We're going to be using this for patient workups, for staffing our hospitals, for picking the right drugs. It's going to really infuse healthcare. And my point as a clinician, and many of us are here, is that technology is an enabler. It shouldn't get in the way of the patient-doctor relationship. Hopefully, it can actually enhance it. New touch points, new ways to be connected, have feedback loops, and compassion through these sorts of realms. OK, last few minutes. Future of therapy. Therapy is getting really interesting now. It's going well beyond the pill. Uh, we have now pills, obviously, with RFID sensors, can track adherence, which can be important. We're seeing replacement of drugs and devices with sort of digiceuticals or uh, the, imp the implant world moving from pacemakers to ones that can treat uh, cardio cardiovascular disease to heart disease to depression to urinary incontinence. Some are even implants that might manage uh, remote control uh, uh, contraception, which might lead to interesting conversations. You know, honey, where's the remote? Or what happens if someone hacks your remote or hacks your pacemaker, you know? Who owns that data? What happens if someone hacks it? Lots of privacy issues. We're entering an era where we'll be prescribing apps with almost every drug and device and combination, whether it's for pregnancy or pre-op care or post-op care. We're seeing that apps can have a big ROI. Mayo Clinic, an app for heart failure, uh, prevented 40% of readmissions or lowered readmission rates by 40%. As the incentives align, this sort of application feedback loop data can be very, very powerful. Part of the future of therapy even today is telemedicine. You can multiple apps today, MD Live, Doctors in Demand, talk to a clinician. Soon that may be your clinician, or you may be the clinician seeing your patients. Maybe you can even bill for it as well. So telemedicine is coming in all sorts of interesting realms, including through telepresence robotics. You can round in hospitals, maybe as a stroke uh, specialist or a remote hospital with robotics. Robotics we see in the, uh, in the uh, operating room all the time. We're seeing them start to del deliver drugs in the, and trays in the hospital. They're enabling the disabled. This woman is paralyzed from the waist down, wearing a robotic exoskeleton. And what's interesting about this technology for her, it's personalized. It's 3D printed to match her own anatomy. And 3D printing is also something that's going to touch healthcare in many surprising ways. Everything from 
printing out a cat, would you rather wear this, or a, a cast you can print in real time in the orthopedic clinic. You know, scan your, your wrist and print, print one that matches, much more comfortable and, and uh, tuned. Or printing stents that can regrow or connect nerves or for the cardiovascular realm. Or I was uh, at MIT uh, meeting a young postdoc there who diagnosed himself with brain cancer, literally helped the surgeons by 3D printing his own brain tumor. And as I left the visit, he's like, you want a copy? I'm like, a copy of what? My brain tumor. And here it is, life-size version. So the empowered patient can even 3D print their own uh, clinical uh, issues and help their, their medical teams. Uh, a company from Singularity University flew the first printer to the 3D printer to the space station, getting devices like medical devices uh, to the space station are difficult and expensive. How what if we can print these in the point of care, in the OR, the stent, the 3D printed knee implant? You can do fun things today with a Microsoft Connect. I can print myself. Here's mini-me, you know, kind of fun to have around in my pocket. But what if I'm uh, treating a patient missing part of their face? We could maybe 3D print a version that matches. Uh, we'll start blending 3D printing with the world of regenerative medicine to build vessels, organs, and beyond. We're in the early stages of making, for example, microorganisms being used for drug discovery, but lots of potential to converge those fields to do clinical trials in new empowering ways. And real briefly, one of my new startups, we're looking at the ability to actually 3D print your own pills, your own combination pill based on all your data. You might even print that in, the, in home every morning. So if you're interested in that, come find me, find me later in telemedicine. All right. Um, I'm a bone marrow transplanter. Stem cells are playing an interesting role in many realms. I invented a new technology to do minimally invasive harvest of bone marrow. Uh, and we can use bone marrow in interesting ways and blend with things like gene therapy and synthetic biology. So for example, now a patient with uh, sickle cell disease, take out some bone marrow, replace the bad gene with CRISPR and other technologies, and do a bone marrow transplant back to the patient and cure them. This has been now done in a few trials with thalassemia, sickle cell, and maybe even HIV in the future. So interesting ways to cure diseases. Last two minutes, I'm running short on time, would be Global impact. These technologies aren't just from Manhattan. We can democratize healthcare in really interesting ways. You know, across the planet, non-communicable diseases have outpaced infectious diseases. If you can connect somebody in, in rural Africa, rural India, rural Indiana with mobile telemetry, point of care sensors, now with companies like Google and Facebook portaling the internet, the bottom billion, the three or four billion on the planet in the next 10 years will be connected. They'll have smartphones, most have SMS phones. What are we gonna do with this new population that it's empowered to own their health and be connected to the cloud, have point of care diagnostics, huge opportunities to democratize healthcare. Even deliver drugs and vaccines. Another Singularity company was the first to think about using drones to deliver things like drugs and vaccines. They piloted it here in Haiti after the earthquake. So you might see everything being delivered, uh, not just uh, from Amazon, uh, to interesting places using these realms, including maybe even a defibrillator uh, when and where you need it. Finally, discovery. You know, Today, it still takes often 17 years to, to discover something and let it get to the clinic. You'll hear from my friend Atul Butte uh, tomorrow. I was at Brown with at uh, residency at uh, Boston Children's and at Stanford. Now he's at UCSF. Thinking about new drug discovery, repurposing, new ways of using data, and new, use of, new ways of reinventing clinical trials, right? How, what, what if you can simply download a trial? Let's say it's for Parkinson's. Uh, download the app, have the drug. You can tell the tremor on your mobile device. In fact, as you know, in the last year, Apple came out with an open source platform research kit. You can download a trial for Parkinson's, whether you're a patient or not. A consent's done there. You can, for example, track your voice, which changes with Parkinson's. Your ability to do tapping, which changes with tremor. Really clever ways. We can essentially do, and this is the Stanford-based cardiovascular trial, a Framingham trial can be democratized and distributed to, I think, 50,000 people signed up on this already for, for, for pennies on the dollar. So democratizing and crowdsourcing everything from clinical trials and beyond. So thinking about crowdsourcing for a second, when you drive with Google Maps, you share a bit of your privacy, your speed and location. In exchange, though, you get a map. This is a map of Rome being built today just from driver's cell phone data and sharing where the cops are hiding out. But in, in tune, you get what's the route to work, what's the, what's the impact of weather and everything else. What if that same sensibility could come to healthcare? What if we could unsilo the data from our different EMR systems and beyond and be able to crowdsource data for proactive uh, evidence, not just evidence-based medicine, but practice-based medicine as we go forward? What if we change our mindset from being maybe blood and organ donors to being data donors? So Mike Sinai is collaborating with Stanford and UCSF and Geisinger and Kaiser that we look at all that data in smart, privacy secluded ways to do the smartest things for our patients. You can even crowdsource medical diagnoses today on a platform like this. Last point would be technology is just one piece of the equation. You need design thinking as well. Sometimes lessons from aviation. I've been a flight surgeon for 15 years in the Air National Guard, I get to fly in fighter jets. Lessons from aviation are infusing healthcare. We've seen checklists in the operating room. Many of you medical students and others train on simulators. There's simulators for everything today. Makes training faster and safer. 
Simulators for everything, and I mean everything, right? Um, but that can improve uh, outcomes and uses design thinking. This idea of air traffic control, seeing patients on trials or patients like you and how they're doing and give ourselves individual dashboards as well as those for our, our patients and, and, and uh, clinical trial cohorts. So in conclusion, you know, it's an exponential age. Um, I want you to be thinking about you know, not just where you are now, but where some of these technologies, AI, robotics, sensors, big data, 3D printing, they're going to be in the next few years. Build to where the puck is going, as Rain Gretzky says. Skate to where it's going to be, not where the puck is now, as you evolve some new innovations. Think about the convergence of all these exponential technologies. How do they overlap from the empowered citizen scientists to body computing to genomics to crowdsourcing to, to ways these inter interact with day-to-day -day clinics and the future of clinical trials? That's where the sweet spot is. And in the realm of digital health, all these things are coming together. And it's even coming on to my old home base of MGH. I went back to visit the same ward this summer, and they had a sign there on the right, innovation unit. So even my old ward uh, can change. And I think, again, if we're thinking exponentially, we can shift from our world of sick care to a world of health care, from our episodic and reactive world we're in today to one that's much more continuous and proactive. And I think there's no more exciting era than today in healthcare. What you're doing here at Mount Sinai is extraordinary. Many of the things developed here and elsewhere are things in my pocket. You know, the future's already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And it's up to all of us who are so blessed to play a part in health and medicine, not to just predict the future, but go out there and create it boldly. So with that, thanks for your attention. Cheers.